Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, City Council Ordinance Subcommittee meeting of February 5th, 2018. All members are present. Um, we do have uh, minutes from the last meeting. I don't know if you had a chance to review those. I did. Okay, so I'd be willing to entertain a motion. I have a question. Oh, yeah. It's not moved so fast. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, do we need to have an amendment or an addendum to this to say that the meeting was recorded live? Oh, oh okay. excellent! Yeah, I could, I can, I can add that in. Because otherwise, I approve them. Well, would you, would you like to wait to? Because, because the, the other thing too, it occurred to me too, as we discussed the, um, the, um, to the CCC regulations as well as this, and it might be good to attach those to those minutes as well. Okay. Do you want to wait? I don't think we have to wait. I think right. we can just uh, think say with those. Disagree, you know, agree to put those. Uh, to add those? In. Absolutely. Um, so I would be willing to entertain a motion to approve the minutes as uh, suggested amended. Motion. Second. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So uh, if anybody here would like to speak to the committee on what we're not talking about tonight. So tonight is uh, a review of recreational cannabis ordinance. So if there's, if you'd like to speak about something that is not that, then now is your time to do it. Otherwise, uh, you will have time as we get into this to uh, let us know your thoughts and opinions. Which brings me to um, why we're here and um, how we're gonna operate. Uh, so we did meet on January 10th, uh, which was in basically an informational meeting for us to hear input from the community. Um, and we didn't deliberate uh, the ordinance that is in front of us proposed from the planning board. Uh, the process is uh, tonight, I'm gonna open it up in the same way to have people be able to share their thoughts and opinions. Um, and as we move forward, um, I've been thinking, and I'm sure the other counselors have been thinking of things that they would like to see or see struck from the planning board ordinance. Uh, we might have um, kind of a cursory discussion on some of those things. Uh, and I think that at the conclusion of this meeting, we'll set another meeting date before the February 20th meeting that is uh, a more of a working meeting um, where we're gonna um, not uh, take public input and just put our noses to the grindstone. Um, so if you want to give input, tonight's the night. Um, and so as we go, I just wanna remind people of our role in this process. Um, recreational cannabis was approved uh, in Massachusetts. Um, it was improved uh, in East Hampton with a over 60% majority. Um, and our job as the ordinance subcommittee is to review the time, place, and manner of uh, potential businesses uh, and the categories of businesses that could come to East Hampton um, and determine the time, place, and manner of those businesses. Uh, so and, you know, any comments that are related to that are great. We are not here to rehash whether cannabis should be illegal or legal. That is uh, settled. Um, so I'm sure some people might have opinions on that one way or another, but really what we wanna hear is we wanna hear what people's thoughts are on recreational cannabis in East Hampton, because we want to make sure that we are creating a responsible um, addition to our community um, that doesn't, that mitigates harm um, and is respectful of all people, uh, whether they're in favor of cannabis or not. Um, so that being said, uh, I don't know if my fellow counselors have anything they wanna add before we start. No, I think you covered it, thank you. Awesome. Nothing to add. So that, with that, uh, we'd be more than happy to hear um, what people, if you've reviewed the, the planning board's ordinance um, and have thoughts about that, that's great. If you have thoughts about things that you would like to see or not see in East Hampton, that, that's wonderfully pertinent. Um, and you know, when you come up to the podium, uh, please state your name and address for the record. Uh, I don't think I need to say this. Uh, this isn't as quite as contentious, contentious as, of an issue as we have had in the past, but like while people are speaking, the audience should be respectful and listen. Um, and if there is um, any back and forth, uh, you know, we, it, since this is a posted meeting and this is what we're discussing, we can have back and forth. Um, and when we do that, 
it's always good to remember that you know being more respectful is is better than being less respectful and not attacking somebody personally is always a very good thing so um, you know those ground rules are, are something that I think are important um, to maintain our decorum not that I thought it was gonna be an issue so please if anybody would like to come up and speak on the issue we'd be happy to hear you Chuck McCullough. I'm from, uh, I live at 42 Ashley Circle. I'm also the Chief Financial Officer at the Williston Northampton School. And uh, I think uh, just this past month, the head of school at Williston Northampton sent to each of the city councilors a letter from Williston Northampton representing some of our thoughts and concerns about the process that we're under right now and some of the things to consider, at least from our perspective. The general theme there. I would say is one of just cautiousness and moderation as we consider this. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the plan is that once you, once you go out, uh, you know, if, if things are taken to, if anything is taken to its extreme, it's always hard to pull back. So our thought is with something this new and in some ways somewhat untested or the still waiting for the data to come back on um, what the impact actually should be on a municipality the thoughtful trying to be a bit more moderate and thoughtful about how we implement this would be a very important theme um, the areas that I would want the uh, ordinance community to consider would be as far as the draft is concerned uh, related to the uh, what the planning board has put together uh, zoning for, uh, for recreational marijuana on the draft of November 21st. Uh, the areas that I'd ask the uh, ordinance committee to consider carefully would be uh, under standards and conditions number five, uh, under A, the 200 foot uh, uh, boundary that we're talking about uh, that would be the distance from uh, any school. It outlines it pretty clearly in the uh, standard. Uh, the state standard from what we have read is 500 feet. And it would just seem that a, a moderate approach might be to stick with the state standard at this point, to start with that and just take that as a basis for the first uh, step in this whole effort. Uh, the second part that we would offer to the ordinance committee would be to, to look at the number on, under H, under standards 5H, 12 retail locations again quite a significant number of retail locations for something that's new and we still need to find out what really, you know, what really would be the impact on the tone and tenor of the town. And the last item would be under I and the 50 feet between each of the retail locations. And again, we ask that uh, each of those things is considered to be uh, more broadly considered. In 50 feet, you might want to consider something more than that. Those are just three measures that I think would be important for the group to consider. Uh, the one I want to emphasize most importantly is the 200-foot buffer. We have two, we, we have three schools right in the center of town right now, public schools of grade schools that uh, may not be there in a number of years, but they are here now and they will be there until at least 2021. And I think that's something we really have to think about and be careful about. So I would offer uh, some, again, you know, the, the guidance from uh, our perspective is to just take some cautiousness and moderation on those particular measures. That one in particular, the 200 foot buffer versus the 500 foot recommendation from the, city, from the state. Uh, the one last point I'll make is this, is uh, um, my daughter lives in Washington State. So we get to go and visit her quite often. And I, I can tell you, and we go there probably three times a year. And um, there are towns that have done this incredibly well. They don't really have an impact on the, as far as the legalization of shops that and retail locations that you can go and, uh, and shop for marijuana. They, they just have no impact. And it's just like any other storefront in town. Uh, some of those towns do it very, very well. I will tell you this, that there are other towns that have not done it well. And, you, and if you don't think that it impacted the tone and tenor of that particular community, you'd be kidding yourself. So I, I, again, I offer the, the level of moderation and care that I think you will be taking on this 
to know that um, it does have an impact on the tone and tenor of a town because I've seen it firsthand. Okay. Thank you very talk, much. Talk, talk. Go ahead, ask. You Please. Say, yeah. So I'm just curious, on the 200 feet concern, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering um, what you think the difference between 200 and 500 feet would accomplish? Well, I think, you know, I think you'll hear from some others here in just a couple of minutes that, um, you know, is, is it a measure that we can use? Let's just see how it goes. Uh, you know, I think the state's recommending 500. I don't think anyone's really going to know, but I think being able to provide a bit more space coming away, you know, the schools that I'm most concerned about right now, other than, you know, obviously Williston, Northampton, which I don't think 500 feet or 200 feet is going to matter that much for our school, uh, but it might, uh, depending on what retail locations are, are decided upon. I'm just, uh, I do think the schools, Center and uh, Pepin, and certainly Maple right now are, yeah, I mean, that's, that's something to consider. Is it the visual of a storefront that troubles you or the fact that it's being sold so near a school regardless of what the storefront might look like if you consider 200 feet near a school well I think you know I think those are other parts that I know that you have to deliberate and think about you know what is it going to look like how overt is it going to be mm -hmm. I think those are all really serious considerations but I do think also just walking walking by a shop that uh, for a, for a young child you know what what is sold there versus what is sold some something else I, I do think that there's some you know just the very presence of that and walking by a storefront like that you know would be would be some of some issue okay. well, I, I, that being I, close by I mean you, you know the, you know let's face facts it's legal we know it's legal and we're gonna have to do the best job we can but offering some moderation uh, you know again about where it's going to be located in proximity to school I think you know that's something to be thoughtful about so I'm going to ask it. You can, you, one, you okay. go ahead. I, well, I have, a, I have a comment and then a, a quick question, Chuck. So the one thing I'll say about you know children walking by and what they perceive or don't perceive the, at least the current um, uh, regulation draft from the state, I think is is pretty robust in terms of making the the signage and the requirements for what is and isn't <coughs> visible from the street. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, pretty uh, it creates uh, it creates obscurity, mm -hmm. um, and I think unless you, you're so saying, oh, and you're speaking now of the state guidance that we've received from that, that we're seeing from the state, right? Correct. The most yeah. recent uh, CCC draft, mm -hmm. they're very strict about making sure that paraphernalia is not visible, and and in fact, the, the actual signage that's going to be used is going to be pretty unclear to the, the general public unless you, you know, you're, they're not gonna be allowed to use things like cannabis, cannabis leaves, leaves and, and words that are suggestive, much like the packaging for edibles, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna follow that on that path. So I just, I want to assure you too that the, the, there, some of those concerns could be allayed by the, mm -hmm. the, the guidance that the state's suggesting. And then, then the, a quick question I had for you though also for, to, to help us is, Anecdotally, and I don't know if you can comment on this, you mentioned Washington State and how some c certain um, municipalities are doing, mm -hmm. doing things well and certain aren't. Do, can you give examples to help us? Um, sure, you know, I'm, you know uh, I'm, I'm gonna have to admit that the, um, the, the names of the towns up there are all kind of a blur to me, but we go in the towns. But I can, you know, actually I could probably email my daughter tonight and just, and Owen, you know, you and I see each other enough that I, I could probably forward that to you and you can share that with the committee. But I mean, there's, you know, I can think of two, two towns right now that I've been in where I can say, well, that's, you know, really done quite well. Right. And, and another town that I've driven in that just was like, what, what an absolute train wreck. And, and obviously we would want to, we would want to create legislation. Yeah, but I could certainly get those names that. for you, those towns. Sure, yeah. or, or and how they and what they're doing specifically would be helpful. Did, did you would be, well, I just want to. I guess I just need to make a comment, um, yeah. and and maybe there's a question in there somewhere. And, and it's, I mean, no disrespect, mm -hmm. um, but I, I just wonder what specifically about cannabis is so much more dangerous or uh, nefarious than, um, you know, if you look at uh, the al the package store. It's at the Pizza House, mm -hmm. which is within 200 feet of Center School. Or if you look at Rite Aid, which sells opioids, mm -hmm. um, why are you not advocating for them to have a buffer so they can't be located where they are? Or why can't they? Why should their advertising be a, 
more accessible to a child who's walking by, where you can see bottles in the window, you can see posters. I mean, you know, my kids all went to Maple School, and I could literally, when I picked them up, I could stand in front of Nini's where I could get beer, mm -hmm. look across the street, see a six foot poster for cigarettes, and see my daughter at school. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder what specifically is it about cannabis that makes it so dangerous it needs to have a larger buffer? Oh, I think you, I mean, it's pretty clear. We're the reason why we're here, right? I mean, it's new. It's, you it's know, not it, new. Well, but I was going to say, it's, it's new in terms of the legalization oh, of it. It's certainly yeah. new. Yeah. It is certainly new. Uh, and, 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 uh, well, I, you know, I guess I'm more, I guess I'm more interested in like the specific danger that we're trying to mitigate here, well, um, I don't, other than it's new. Yeah, I don't think I, I, I don't think I use the word danger. I, I think. Well, I mean, I'm, I think if you're trying to keep people, you know, a certain distance away from something, mm -hmm. you're implying that that's because there's a danger of that thing. Well, I think you know, like a, 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 a fire truck says, keep back 100 feet. So it, it says that because if you get closer than that, there's a danger to you. Mm -hmm. So I, I get, I'm just trying to figure it out. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I think first, it's it, the, the legalization of it is new, correct? Uh, yes. Right? No. Here. Okay, so Not we're, in Colorado, so we're, but here. Yeah. yeah. But fair, even in Colorado, it's still fairly new. A few you know, years. it's still only yeah. within its last decade. So, so I think society in itself is just trying to get its arms around this. And, you know, there are going to be people in this room who have different perspectives on, you know, on the impact of marijuana on society, on kids. And we can't, we can't change that. But I, I think that, you know, my emphasis to you as an ordinance committee is given all that, shouldn't we be taking some very, very moderate steps that can be, you know, at some later point as we start to get comfortable with this that you can go back and revisit and toggle back on certain controls that's sure. why the 500 feet seems to be it's what the state recommended seems like a reasonable way to go you know it's it, i don't think you know there's anything other than just it's a good a feeling. moderate step you know is 12 retail is, you know, that strikes strikes us as being a, a bit extreme mm -hmm. so maybe what we do is we say maybe there's just a limited number in that regard mm -hmm. 50 feet you know between each one well maybe we just make that a bit more and let's just wade into this a little bit rather than jumping in with both feet noted yeah thanks okay. well, thank you sure. and i also want to just a shout out to Willison, and thank you for coming to the meeting because I we do, we did all get this letter from um, Robert, Robert. Hill, yeah. and um, in it, he, sorry, <laughs> and in it he mentioned you know that we we can go to him to meet with him at any time we wanted to, and I really appreciate the fact that you came here okay. because I, I I think that's important and it's an important distinction that if these are your concerns you need to come to us to tell them we don't necessarily need to go to you right. to right. hear them. So I just, I appreciate you coming out. Thank you. And I, I, will, and I will also offer that, you know, some of the questions that, um, you, that you, you asked maybe as far as what they've seen, the professionals on our campus who've seen impact on you mm -hmm. and, and their knowledge, I think they are, they're incredibly knowledgeable mm -hmm. people. So it's another point of view and certainly be, be very willing to have anybody come to visit or, you know, vice versa. Sure. So we're, we're Pretty much have an open door on. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Good evening. I'm Nancy Follinsby, Superintendent of Schools, and um, I wanted to come and uh, speak about what um, Mr. McCullough has also mentioned the, the 200 uh, foot um, distance from a marijuana establishment. I, I guess I was curious as to why uh, it was 200 feet as opposed to the state recommendation of 500 feet. And I, and I did listen, uh, Salem, to your, your questions, and I think those were good questions. Um, I think for me, it feels like there's a, a perception, and I, and I think that uh, Chuck has alluded to that as well. This is all new for us. And so I think there may be a perception among our families who want to send their children to our schools that if our schools are located uh, in the midst of a number of, of shops um, selling cannabis, that that may not, uh, because it's so new and because we're not familiar with it, may be uh, 
a, a perception that's not a positive one about uh, where our schools are and where they want their children to attend schools. In fact, um, you know, it's come to my attention that there are people out in the community who are saying that, that they would uh, have a problem sending their children to a school that was located so closely to a, um, a distributor of, of cannabis. So it's just something that I think the, the council should uh, perhaps consider. Um, and uh, we do know that we're hoping that we'll have a new um, pre-K to 8 school. Um, but that's not going to happen for uh, a number of years. Uh, the uh, removal of our students from their present schools uh, in the middle of town to that new school, probably not until 2021. So um, I guess I'm just echoing again what um, Chuck has said. You know, maybe it's uh, worth considering um, uh, taking a, a slower approach to this. Uh, initially and um, and then as we begin to to implement that and I just wanted to uh, let you know my thoughts on that Thanks, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. so uh, I do actually I would like you to ask answer what uh, superintendent policy asked which was what was the impetus behind the 200 feet versus 500 feet uh, 200 feet was the um, what we used for the medical marijuana ordinance okay and where'd you get that from was that so that was just <coughs> you know reviewing um, specific spaces in town that could potentially host and trying to figure out a reasonable distance and and I mean at the end of the day I'm not convinced there's any buffer that really makes it just well I've never seen research that shows that a buffer does anything for anything is there a buffer for liquor stores there's not a buffer for liquor stores is there a buffer for tobacco no is there a buffer for opioids no and I'll also add, I believe, and I might be wrong, but I, um, there's a, another, I'm blanking on the name of the town, um, but uh, there, there's another town that recently came out with uh, their a can of, a finalized cannabis ordinance, and their buffer, I think, is 100 feet. Right. Um, I just, I've just never seen research that says a buffer accomplishes anything other than a feel-good buffer. You know, I, I just don't think that, I don't know. But I've never, I mean, I know that there's no buffer for a package store, and I don't know if that's, you know, made a, a difference. Tobacco, doesn't tobacco have a buffer? I don't believe so. If it does, then the corner store next to Maple School is out of compliance, because yeah, that's I, like 50 I, feet. I, I think there might be, I just think that, you know, whether it's been addressed or not, I don't think, but I, I believe there is. I, I mean, I, I would say that I don't think there is, because um, the, I know that any time we have looked at regulating tobacco other than at, you know, I know that when we're looking at putting the age, the health department was looking at putting the age of 21, I was getting calls from lawyer, um, you know, lawyers, from lobbyists for the tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. They don't like it when you regulate mm -hmm. tobacco. Well, and again, I, I want to say that um, my point is perception. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think we're talking about danger. I don't think we're talking about um, whether it's going to promote uh, the use of cannabis or not, but it's about perception of the families in our community. And I would make a parallel to that with a, a package store. Mm -hmm. Do we really want our, our elementary schools located right next to a package store mm -hmm. if, if we could uh, have done it differently? So um, it's about perception. Sure. And I just would ask that you take that into consideration and, and the 500 uh, feet uh, state limit. Okay. Thank you. Do you mind if I make a comment? Please. So, so and I, that's important, Nancy. And the and the the the, the prevailing undercurrent, the uh, recurring term, both from you and Chuck, is perception, right? So we do indeed have a package store and two bars at least visible from Maple Street School, and maybe that's perceived as good or bad. I don't really know what the perception is, but the bottom line is it's there. But how do we change perception? Do we create buffer zones or do we create community education? Mm -hmm. And do we find ways through this whole process to create community education with some sort of arm of either the municipality or other, some, some other private firm, maybe East Hampton Media or some private citizen who says it's not about buffering, it's about eliminating stigma and educating the community and educating children so they really understand what this is about. Because all we do, with, I think, with creating a buffer, and I think this is kind of what Councillor Derby touched upon and Councillor Conniff, is that we, we maintain that mystique. We maintain that stigma. 
and, and the whole point here is to reduce stigma and just offer education. And I'm not saying this is something that's not harmful, and I'm not saying that this is something that youth should be exposed to. I'm just saying that it's something that we should create um, education, and that way we can maybe reduce or change perception. And then I, I'd offer a counter that the uh, so do both. I mean, I, I think it's a is a moderate approach. Um, you know, the state has a recommendation. We can debate all day long whether buffers do it or not. But I mean, as a as a moderate, good first approach. You know, would that allow people to get comfortable in the air in the in the way that you're suggesting? Uh, and I wholeheartedly agree with you. That's why, you know, in the evening council with Tom Connor, there's an education part of this that has to be part. Uh, there, that's, and, but the, I think it's all about the community starting to get comfortable with it. And you know, if a buffer will allow us to do that and will give you the uh, ability to be able to ratchet back when that comfort zone is there, the comfort level is there and the education's there, then so be it. Yeah. Well, as with most things, it's always it's somewhere in the middle, right? So yeah, I think it's yeah. There's wiggle room, right? There's wiggle room. Yeah. Hi, I'm Becca Velosky. I live at 53 Holyoke Street. So I'm on my 12th year owning a home in town here. Um, I want to say first of all, I am entirely against youth using marijuana in a recreational form. I want to make that absolutely my starting point. I do not believe that children should be using marijuana. Um, Secondly, I want to say um, I have no personal stake in the buffer, whether it's two or 500 feet, I personally don't care, but we are talking about perception. And I think that what we may have been deciding was encouraging businesses because that's our mission right now. It is legal and we are allowed to do this. So if we're working from a standpoint where we're saying 200 feet, there is that perception like there's something wrong with it. Now that's a bad place to start. I really think it's important that we watch our arbitrary judgments. I know people have concerns about marijuana use. Um, I grew up in high school. I, I tried pot a few times. I drank a lot. I don't know if you know the differences in behavior. It's huge. The differences in drinking behavior and um, smoking pot behavior are very different. The violence is very different. It's a totally different atmosphere. If you went to a Super Bowl party and you were with drinkers, and if you were at a party where marijuana was being consumed, you might feel a little less frightened in the marijuana party. It's a very different atmosphere. And if you've not been exposed to it, you have no way of knowing. I don't know if you've heard of the movie Reefer Madness, but that was, I believe, made in 1937. And that was set out as a true story to educate America about what this drug was doing to people. And it's completely false and ridiculous. And I would love to show it to people so you could say, wow, look where we were this many years ago to what we know now. I highly recommend that you get familiar with what it's actually like. It's, there shouldn't be this tremendous fear factor. Again, I say I don't want the youth using it. I think the more exciting we make it seem, to the kids, they're gonna be more enticed. And you know what? I personally don't think it's that exciting a substance. It's, it's really not. So I think people need to learn that. And as you were saying right before I stood up, I wrote a huge statement. It's our mission to educate people, not move forward in a progressive sense of building laws for our community based on misperceptions and lack of knowledge. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good yeah. evening, Councillor. How are you? Good. How are you? And your name Good. is? Mayor Nicole LaChapelle. Oh, okay, thank you. Speaking for the first time in front of this uh, subcommittee, and I probably think not the last. Well, <laughs> um, one, I would say thank you to everyone here in this room for thoughtful dialogue, investigation, and comments over, you know, from the beginning to, to I would say, soon end, not soon end, and the beginning of this really new frontier. Um, economically but also socially for East Hampton and I think that there is strong merit um, when someone makes the argument around the opportunity before us as a community and that can't be taken lightly the other thing that can't be taken lightly is what this actually does um, now and going forward to our municipal laws and zoning code uh, where we're going with our master plan 
and I would ask this subcommittee to continue that um, careful examination for impact now but going forward. Um, I do believe uh, in talking to other municipal officials across the state that East Hampton is on the right track and that the work um, on both sides, both on government and in private sector and the education community is a healthy discussion that needs to continue and I have full faith that we'll end up in the best possible place. That said, um, I am not a municipal law wonk at all. Um, but I am happy on uh, uh, kind of the, the quick, not the official announcement I'd like to make, um, would like to bring up now Jeff Bagg, who's just signed an employment agreement to join us as our new city planner. Uh, oh. Given the, yeah, I didn't see that coming, so. <laughs> um, so uh, this is what I'll say, is that Jeff and I actually are running to another meeting to firm up some other stuff, looking at the timeline um, of these bylaws, ordinances, and whatnot, I felt it was necessary after talking to him uh, to bring him forward and just comment and get some stuff on the record around uh, zoning and um, the proposed regulations. So less than the, the introduction you deserve, Jeff uh, mm -hmm. Bag, our newest city planner. It, Great. Yeah. And, I, uh, and I asked if we could cut in the line. And, <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, are you, is it with a J or a G? It's with a J. Okay, two uh, Fs? Two Fs and two Gs in, in my last name okay. as well. Um, thank you. This is a little bit impromptu, but um, I'm Jeff Bagg. I am uh, recently hired as the city planner, although I don't officially start for a little while yet. Um, but um, just as a way of background, um, I'm currently working with the Central Mass Regional Planning Commission. Uh, I was there for a year and a half, and through that, um, job as a project manager, I initiated a uh, central mass oriented educational and technical assistance um, program for all the towns in central mass to understand the recreational marijuana law. Um, so we've held a lot of successful events over the past year and a half and educated those towns with the mechanics, um, the technical aspects, and some of the, some of the things that municipalities should really be looking at. Um, before that, I was a senior planner with the town of Amherst uh, for eight years, um, and during that time, I was involved with how the town was um, working through the medical marijuana process. So I have a I have a wealth of experience in this realm. I will say that I do other things too. So I recently completed a master plan for the town of West Brookfield and parking studies and other normal planning related things. Um, I think what I was hoping to just identify as just one thing that still would warrant some additional consideration of this committee and, and um, the other committees moving forward, which is really just um, under the standards and conditions mentioned, section five, it's the item J, which is the, the aspect related to social consumption. Um, when the draft regulations came out at the end of December, they really, are implementing what the voters passed back in November. And so it really left um, somewhat of a question about how the social consumption um, process was going to occur in terms of a municipality. And so uh, there was some confusion uh, around whether a town could proactively put it in their zoning and allow it, or whether the, the actual language in the November 2016 uh, ballot was, was in place and what that required was that a citizen petition be filed with 10 percent of the voter signatures that would put it on the election so it would be a town-wide ballot vote as to whether or not to allow on-site consumption and so that is set to occur at this November's election um, so I'm lucky enough to have coordinated an event last Friday with uh, one of the cannabis control commissioners um, Catherine Doyle um, an attorney from KP law a uh, couple minute page, so Katie Lockman, and then a planner from a town in Central Mass. And so that was the second time that they reiterated that the on site consumption provision remains in place, except that uh, it requires a, a community go to the ballot process to have the community decide whether or not to allow it. So, in a really long winded way of saying that there, there appears to be a question about whether or not that Section J should be in there so soon or whether it's something that would come after. So um, I uh, did want to close by saying 
Um, I've had a couple discussions with Jessica, and we held an event. I was a panelist um, in an event back in October where the chair of the planning board from East Hampton came to Central Mass and learned uh, what was going on. And um, through this time, I have actually been watching what East Hampton's doing as a very progressive, forward-thinking town. Um, and now I have this new lens of, of working directly with the town moving forward. But my reason for coming here was just because the timeline's so tight and you're offering the opportunity for, for comments and questions. So uh, I look forward to working with this committee, the planning board, and anyone else um, as my position takes shape. Great. So thank you. Thank Jeff, you I, have a, I have a request for you. Yes. Um, and since you are, I don't know, officially hired yet, sounds like pretty close I if not. not okay. I have not started. Um, and <laughs> since the CCC hasn't finalized their uh, regulations, on, the, on behalf of East Hampton, or at least on behalf of, I think, the intent of what the planning board gave to us, um, and for a lot of different reasons, I think it makes a lot of sense, not only because of the will of the voters, but because of the, the burdensome nature of doing a ballot initiative. Yes. Um, our request is to have on-site consumption as a city choice. As a, as a community that passed this overwhelmingly. Um, and I can't say that strongly enough. Uh, and, and I'll give you my, if you have a minute, I don't know if you have a minute, but, and I'll give you my rationale. Um, yeah. I would just say that the Cannabis Control Commission is holding their public hearings I this know. week. It would be uh, helpful for a planner to, that knows right. them, maybe has some connections to say that as well. Um, but via I the, think- Via the public hearing process, of course. Uh, yes. yes, of course. <laughs> uh, but I think that for us, as a community that is looking at this as coming, you know, it's not an if it's gonna come, it's, it's gonna come. Um, if you don't have an on-site consumption piece, that creates a, a kind of a dire situation in the idea of creating a respectful, um, you know, community-oriented approach to this. Because if you have people coming from out of town that go to a place where they can legally buy it and they legally buy it and have nowhere to consume it, that's a problem. Um, if if you have someone that comes and buys it, sits in their car and says, hey, well, I have nowhere to go to do it, so I'm gonna sit in my car, that creates a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so for safety reasons, for you know, the, the community um, kind of approach we wanna take to this, on-site consumption is just a no-brainer. Um, and so we wanna be able to have a guarantee or at least have you know, people working towards this being something that does not have to go through a ballot process. So that's, that's just my request. Right, and it, it looks like from the, ironically, the, uh, the public hearing tour started today and there was a session in Holyoke. Um, At two. Yep, there are, several, people work. there are several opportunities throughout the state and it does say that uh, anyone, so presumably a municipality could also submit written comments by February 15th and I think it would be putting that position in front of them for them to consider they would need to make some sort of legislative change to allow that because it's different than what the, the voter initiative ballot did in November, but I think. Um, Which is what, we're hearing a lot of mixed messages on that one. Right. right, and that's why I've been studying it for a year and a half and every day there's a new question about some aspect of it, so it's still a learning process. Okay, yeah. okay. where is that information about requiring a, a ballot initiative? Because the current draft regulations, it just, it mentions it as a matter of fact, but doesn't mention ballot initiative anywhere. Yeah, it's been that's been part of the point of confusion because the draft regulations are in depth and they have a lot of items, as you mentioned, security measures and protocol and application process. But what it really does is actually implement the language that was in the voter uh, ballot in November. So, for an example, some of the changes that happened with the yes and no vote for communities doesn't actually make it to the regulations, it's in place via the, the prior legislation. So unfortunately, you have to look in two places, the, the ballot measure language and then the regulations, and that's definitely caused some confusion. Yeah. Um, so, okay. so I look forward to working with you all in the, okay. in the near future. Welcome, welcome right. aboard. Great. Thank you. I think there's a, there's a line, Stephen. <laughs> Hello, my name is Bill Hartley and I'm not a speaker, so we'll see how this goes. <clears throat> but when I was listening to Chuck initially, I sort of questioned the way that 
cannabis is judged as being more harmful than alcohol and cigarettes. And part of that is that um, both of my parents had lung cancer, so I, I know the, the dangers of cigarettes. Uh, I don't think that uh, cannabis is without its dangers. It certainly does have dangers, and it can be abused, and, and I'm not for abuse. And uh, I certainly respect Chuck, uh, Chuck as an educator, and both my wife and I are strong proponents of education. We both have uh, MBAs. My daughter went to Smith College, and uh, four of us in the family, I am going to apply for a recreational marijuana license, and the four of us in the family, it would be a little mom and pop's operation. And I believe in moderation. And I also want to say about the, the 12 potential I think there are potentially 12 licenses in the town. I'm not a rich person. Uh, we've saved our money, and this is sort of a dream for me. And it's costing us money already. And I'm about to sign a lease, and that is going to cost me money. And I'm going to have to pay that money before I even know if I'm going to be given the license. So that is a sacrifice. And if I do get the license, I am going to be supportive. I will be supportive of education. Right now I work at an insurance company, and I've been working at an insurance company for probably 25 years. And I do volunteer work, and, and I was recognized as one of the top three volunteers at the Hartford in Hartford, Connecticut. So I think that if I'm offered a license, I will do volunteer work and I will try to build up the community and I, I think it's a tremendous opportunity for this town. Um, in terms of the 12 licenses, this is a relatively small town. I don't know how many people they're going to pull in here and I don't know how many businesses this town will support. I do think though that the free market will ferret out those businesses that you know, aren't operating uh, efficiently. Uh, so. All I really just want to say is I just hope that you keep an open mind in terms of people that would be running some of these establishments. I'm completely opposed to drug addiction, alcoholism, cigarettes, and even excessive marijuana use. <clears throat> but I also I do think that marijuana is less apt to be abused than these other than these other items. I'm a strong supporter of education. My wife and I have been married for 25 years, uh, probably life <laughs> um, so but anyway so I'm a family person I honestly am and I believe in education and I want to make this work and I want to make it work for everyone uh, and I think education uh, educators are the most important pers people in our society and uh, I have a world of respect for that so thank you Bill thank you Bill what's your thank what's your address can you give me your address quickly yes it's 635 Graham Road <laughs> is that that is in South Windsor Thank you. Good evening. My name is Barbara Simpson, and I'm from One Crestview Drive. I have lived in East Hampton for 45 years, and I've never been to a meeting. So I feel like I'm welcome, like, welcome. Hey. welcome. My name is Barbara Simpson. I'm at my first meeting. <laughs> um, what brings me here is a little bit different than most people. Um, I am in the business of insurance, and I'm focusing on cannabis insurance. So I live in town, I know this business quite well. I've been to Colorado, I've been following it from a products liability, a bodily injury, property damage to the consumers <clears throat> and protecting the business owners as they go down this venture. What is gonna be required? So I'm, I'm looking at this, I got brought into a little room and got something given to me and I didn't see a lot of definitions um, between, I'm, I'm first of all, I'm also a supporter of this. Um, I would not sell anything that I don't stand behind. But I didn't see a lot of definitions between CBD and THC on, on your document. Um, is that accurate? That's, that's correct. So um, those definitions would be within the state regs. Mm -hmm. So our definitions would be more broad related to the time, like time, place, and manner. Right. And, and obviously on, on Jay, you're, you're definitely talking about the consumer use. And I mean, when I think about as THC is a whole different with the hallucinogenics, a lot different than a CBD, the CBD oils on, on a massage and different things, how it could be used. 
maybe there should be viewed differently um, as you're going down this path of, of what you're going to do with it. Well, the, where it is different, just to jump in, is um, for any sort of consumption on site, mm -hmm. it's broken down into two categories, primary and secondary? Primary, uh, secondary and mixed. Uh, primary okay, mixed or like primary that. and mixed. And so if okay. more than 50% of the, of the sales are, would mm -hmm. be from cannabis, mm -hmm. then it's primary. Mm -hmm. If less, so say a massage, you know, studio or a yoga studio or something. Um, so that that's where that distinction would be for us in zoning. Okay, so it's not. So C they could still CBD sell CBDs, but they could also sell THCs. THCs. And on, on the last one, I was wondering about was um, the no pesticides, herbicides, and all that. Um, how are you going to regulate that? Now, um, federally, it's it's regulated by the Federal C Crop Association, but on this one, I mean, how is it? So if you have an outdoor grow. Um, <laughs> How are you going to say you can't have herbicides, pesticides? Well, well what, what path are you going, going to go down on, on crop cultivation? So that's a great question. That was one of the areas that I was looking to strike from the, the, yeah. the version. That and there's also another one that um, dictates how much uh, uh, LED lighting needs to be present. Uh, there's a couple that I've already kind of pegged as yeah. we probably need to get rid of this, and that is it, Because it's not practical for, for an outdoor grow. Yeah, well, well, you're not, I mean, I think no, outdoor grows aren't going to be allowed no anyways in the state regulations. Another thing we've been looking at is potentially green, maybe greenhouse, hmm. so that, but, which wasn't added. But that issue, too, with the pesticides, et cetera, I think someone brought that up on the board of the planning board, because it's, it's kind of, it, it, one can't exist without the other to some degree also. Exactly. So okay. what could consist of pesticide, et cetera, it's all chemical fertilizers, but yeah. Well, and I know this state is going to be pretty close to regulating a lot of that stuff. I know for medical, it has to be organic, and that's one of the things when they get inspected, which apparently happens quite a bit, right. they, they check on the types of fertilizers they're using. They, they're requiring that they carry products liability to protect the consumer also. Yeah. So thank you very much. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Seth Frappier. I'm currently relocating to East Hampton. I'm the founder and operator of Chronic Trips and uh, looking for a social consumption license for my adventure and wellness center. Um, I just wanted to bring up a little bit of tidbits for uh, some of the folks that might be uh, apprehensive of this legislation. Uh, I've been, some folks are kind of going, wow, I never thought this would come about in my lifetime. I've prep been prepping for this my entire life. And so I'm one of the ones that have been following this ever since I was a young kid. I've been just praying for the opportunity for it to happen. And so for specifically the last two years, I've been going to all the conventions, all of the networking events, the business meetings, religiously and relentlessly. And it is a I can assure you that is an industry standard for social stewardship and education regarding this uh, this industry coming through, and so I highly suggest everybody check out Normal's uh, write up about responsible use of cannabis consumption. They wrote it in 1996, and it is worldwide, uh, or it has been adopted worldwide as part of their principles for responsible uh, consumption use of cannabis to the public. And I can assure you that all social consumption uh, establishments are following these industry standards as well um, by going to all these meetings, these business events, and networking, all these things. Um, we do realize that we're building a plane as it's flying, but we're not using nuclear weapons. We're just using a plant and we're just really trying to um, bring it to light in something that is fairly uh, religious. <laughs> so that's all I have for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh. Marty Klein, Seven Stone Path Lane. I've lived in East Hampton since 1999. Um, regarding the uh, the question of the, the buffer and 200 feet versus 500 feet. Um, I have a master's in planning and I, I remember a couple words. I don't remember a lot from my, my grad school days, but 
I do remember a couple of words, and I think that they were in relation to um, zoning laws, and those are arbitrary and capricious. And so I would challenge those of you who were asking for a 500-foot buffer to, um, to come up with some facts as to why 500 feet is safer than 200 feet and what is the harm um, that is prevented from that additional 300 feet. It, I'd love to see the studies. I've yet to see anything. And I've yet to see any evidence from studies in Colorado saying that youth use has gone up since it's been legal. If anything, it's stayed the same or gone down. So it sounds arbitrary and capricious to say we want a 500-foot buffer. I'd love to hear you ar um, argue for a 500-foot buffer for alcohol and tobacco, proven harmful substances. Has there been a long-term long -term study of kids who went to Maple Street School showing that because 50 feet or 100 feet from a package store, the percentage of kids that turned into alcoholics who went to Maple Street School is much higher than at other schools. I don't think there is such a, a study, but uh, you know that would be helpful. Um, I've done a lot of different things, uh, educating people on, on different areas, and um, I do plan on being active in an educational campaign here, working with uh, East Hampton Media, and probably I might put something together on my own, as I did back in February, to educate people about growing under the new law. Um, I, I've given some thought to that, but I absolutely want to be involved in a public education campaign because I don't think that people should feel this is being shoved down their throat and it's new and not everybody understands. Um, well, people are still caught up, some people, in um, reefer madness thinking. So I call it one of the greatest fake news campaigns in history and it was very successful and it's time for it to enter into the dustbin of history. Um, and, a, and just a reminder, this law was passed by adults over 21 for adults. And so we're, you can't even get into a shop unless you show an ID showing that you're 21 plus. So I'm, I'm just having a hard time understanding the harm to youth by virtue of the fact that this is okay for adults. I'm, I'm just not making that connection. So. I would love to see some hard evidence and not create a zoning law based on arbitrary and capricious uh, evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I think I think it's probably a true statement to say that really change is hard. Like mm -hmm. any kind of change is just hard. Some people it's a lot harder than others. Some people embrace change. I happen to be an embracer of change. So I I do understand that people are very cautious who maybe have not used marijuana, it's not part of their generational thinking. Um, and I, I fall into that category. I'm, I have no interest in using it. Um, but I think it is valuable from a, a municipal perspective. I think it's, it's a new revenue stream that we don't have. I look at it kind of that way mm -hmm. with my finance background, what <laughs> I remember from my finance. Um, but I also think it's important that we, and Marty said it, and I think Councilor, uh, Der, uh, what's your Zaret. name? Zaret. Zaret, yeah, Owen, <laughs> um, said it, that it really is perception, and it really is education. It's all about that. And I think the better job we do with that, I think will make this go a lot easier. And I think, it, Marty, anything you want to do to go put forth on the educational side, anything we can do, I'm very interested to talk to the new city planner about some of the, the things he's put in place. I think that is where our value is going to be going forward mm -hmm. um, because we'll be here for the next 100 years talking about I'm for it, I'm against it, I'm for it, I'm against it, 200 feet, 500 feet, 50 feet, 20 feet. Mm -hmm. it, it, that is not going to get us any, anywhere. We just really need to understand that this is not going to be the worst thing that has ever happened to us. We just all have to go into this very uh, open-minded and look at it strictly from it's a change, sure, but 
I don't think that it needs to be kind of this frightening thing that is going to turn the city around and turn us all into uh, uh, reefer madness folks. Uh, agreed. Yeah, and and so. I think before Karima comes up, um, just as far as like the youth access, I think the, the 21 plus piece of this is so critical to, mm -hmm. to acknowledge because as of right now, anybody that lives in the state of Massachusetts can grow up to six plants in their house. And if we want to prevent youth access, it would probably make a lot of sense to allow adults that want to use cannabis to have an easier access to it where they could purchase it by showing an ID than having, you know, all of these houses that are growing cannabis. I mean, it's a fact that when you regulate something and you take it out of the black market, it makes it more difficult to get. It's a fact. It's, it's a fact with alcohol. It's, it's going to be a fact with cannabis. And, you know, I think that, yes, we want to protect the youth, but at what cost? Do we want to protect the youth from them knowing what cannabis is and never mm -hmm. seeing a shop? But their parents grow it in their house and they know where they keep it. You know, uh, that's not, I don't think that's protection. I think if we uh, get people easier access to cannabis, then we're probably going to have less people growing. I mean, obviously there's going to be some people that still do. There's people that brew their own beer. Um, and, and I think that's an important statement and point that needs to be made that hasn't really been made yet. So, do you have anything? Do you think you said it all? Great. Great. My name is Karima Risk, and I live at 38 Everett Street in East Hampton, Massachusetts. Um, I've been a frequent face and attended every single planning board meeting, so I had the wonderful privilege of getting to watch the crafting. Um, and I, my comment actually tonight is more of a technical nature regarding, um, unfortunately, um, the superintendent and the gentleman from Williston left, but specifically, I just wanted to kind of provide further elaboration. Um, so the term, it may be nomenclature, but the term was used as a rec uh, state recommended buffer zone of 500 feet. There is no state recommendation for any buffer zone. It is by default. That is what happens. It is an arbitrary number that has been set and specifically the intent of the law is one of federalism that is jointly regulated by both the local government and the state government. And so in this instance, what they also say is that the um, regulations cannot be so difficult that they are reasonably impractical for any business owner to meet the threshold. And so I just wanted to offer the counter perspective that in addition to um, looking at buffer zones, which I too care, I'm a parent, I'm a, I have a child in public school, and I'm also in the coalition of responsible users who want to see it done right um, and not to see our reputation or perceptions fail. Um, but what they um, fail to mention is that um, we also need to take into account what is the commercial availability of profit um, and also how much of the buffer zones, how much, um, how much space is there actually when you look into the buffer zone? So I can say, as a person in East Hampton who for six months has been studying this very issue, it is extremely hard to find. The buffer, the, the, the threshold is already right up to here. There's almost nothing in East Hampton that is properly zoned where you can park and you can meet all these regulations. It is like trying to set up for Fort Knox. Um, so I think that's something that also has to be available. Um, another thing too that, it, this is very much for the city planner as well, and I know Jessica Allen mentioned in previous conversations, you have to look at each community in their unique circumstances, their density layout, how is their downtown organized, where are the industrial districts. Each municipality has different circumstances, population need, favorability, how they feel on this issue. It's a diverse array of factors, and that's very why the very mechanism of the planning board and the local zoning ordinance was put into place so that we could comment. And so I think us looking at it as a size, a smaller town, but also with our demographics, we are unique. And so we are not going to gather a state default recommendation, in my point of view, would not work for us. Um, certainly, one of the conversations that happened for anyone who attended the planning board meetings was that um, the intent of including the downtown district was that there are many, many places vacant. And so one of the goals of the planning board and of, um, I think, the, our community in general is how do we fill those vacancies? How do we, if this is, business is coming here, how do we put those good do tax dollars to work? How do we fill commercial spaces? How do we develop a robust economy that trickles down to other parts of businesses? And so those are some of the core issues that we're looking at and that were looked at in great detail that came, uh, preceded the draft ordinance. So I think that's important. Um, and 
I may reserve this for, for the next time, and, and I've been a constant figure here, but I, I do want to just say that as a responsible parent, I do str truly believe that social consumption is an issue of civil rights, of social justice, and social responsibility, and that many other states who have gone out ahead of us and done, had the experiment of a recreational marijuana have in time come to this very same conclusion that Massachusetts is at, is that social consumption is the right thing to do. We need a responsible place for responsible adults to go. If they don't want to bring marijuana in the homes, they don't want to bring it in for their children. Um, you know, not everybody has a home, and so that's biased, and it's really presumptuous to assume that everybody can smoke in their home. Renters are precluded, veterans, many other people. So um, I think looking at access, having fair and equitable access for minorities, for veterans, for poor people, renters, is also really, really a priority as well. So thank you so much. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. And I just want to dovetail into what you said. I think Greenfield has been dealing with an issue specifically around um, a medical marijuana user in, who was using in her apartment, uh, which is uh, not allowed because it's a federally subsidized and is looking at eviction. If there was a social consumption um, you know, place that existed, that would not be an issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Mike Cutler, and I'm a lawyer from Northampton, so I appreciate the opportunity to uh, address uh, your board as an out-of-towner. Uh, I'm also a parent, and I'm also uh, a lawyer who worked on the drafting team for Question 4. So I want to touch on really just two uh, items of the draft, and I know we've spoken, uh, but I want to uh, emphasize the first and most important one is that with regard to the uses within the industrial zone. There had been, uh, I'll call it an incongruity, a difference between the medical uh, proposed draft zoning and the non-medical zoning. And it's my understanding that you're moving towards enabling uh, all of the non-medical uses to be available within the industrial zone. And if that is, uh, in fact, where this is headed, then uh, I commend you for uh, making that uh, consistent uh, amendment to the draft. The second point I'd like to touch on is uh, social use. And uh, I was surprised to hear uh, your new town planner talk about the uh, potential for a necessary uh, qualifying vote by the town in order to enact the ordinance. Uh, I'm here to be at least of two sources of a different view. Uh, one is as a member of the drafting team, uh, it was certainly our intent uh, and an intent that was not, I don't think, appreciably changed by the legislative amendment of question four, that the purpose of the initiative was to give citizens of a town the ability to call the question, to uh, call for the town to enact some local regulation rather than it being a barrier to any town enacting uh, social use. And although, uh, your, your, uh, your new planner referenced uh, Commissioner Doyle. Uh, I'm here to tell you that I participated in a Boston hearing at the Massachusetts uh, Bar Association's Continuing Legal Education Facility where uh, Commissioner Doyle participated and where this precise question was framed to her, does a town need to have a referendum before enacting social use regulation? And her answer was quite unequivocally no. Uh, so uh, the, the way the, the statute has operated and the way the commission has operated with regard to its draft regs is that the commission has taken upon itself to issue guiding regulations for municipalities for social use. That is your authorization to enact social use legislation. You do not need uh, a referendum. but. Uh, uh, that, that's at least one lawyer's opinion, and I would suggest it's at least one commissioner's uh, opinion. We'll see how that uh, plays out. But I commend you for taking on social use. Uh, I commend you for amending uh, your draft to uh, allow non-medical to be, uh, all non-medical licenses to be available in an industrial zone. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, anybody else like to talk? And then, um, so one of the things that would just, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Stephen. You waited all that time. I did. Stephen Litsky from Five River Valley Way. And uh, the reason I raised I, my hand a, a little while ago was in, uh, um, uh, at the time in which we were talking about 
this is precisely the point that uh, the new planner was making. Uh, I happened to attend uh, today's uh, uh, Cannabis Commission uh, hearing. I guess I'm one of those unusual ones going to uh, what you were saying before, but I had the ability. But I wasn't the only one because a bunch of the folks here were also there, including Mike. Um, and to the point which, which is that uh, the process here isn't about relitigating anything, right, where we pass it. So I do have, and this I guess will be worked out, but at, at today's uh, hearing, uh, there wasn't actually anyone who, the, the issue about, the, uh, about uh, the, the social consumption and what the statute versus the regs say actually wasn't raised uh, at all. Um, Mike didn't raise it, uh, others didn't raise it. Um, but um, actually, um, in some testimony that was given by some of the groups that are, are in the drug prevention, um, to the point I think that you had made, uh, Owen, it's useful sometimes in regulations if you can make reference to where it fits in the statute just so it makes it more user friendly. Not that it has to, because the regulations fill the gaps of the statute. So there is no real reference, and, and there are various points in the, in, you know, because look, these regulations are going to be far larger in size than the, than the statute itself. That's not unusual whatsoever. But, um, but there will be areas in which th 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 they, th you need to understand the fit. And so we did actually, th there were some people uh, who, who testified as saying if, if the commission can make it a little bit more explicit in the regulations about, you know, where the reference is, because I think it would help in this thing. So my understanding, anyhow, is consistent with what the new city planners um, um, understanding is, which is that the statute does speak to that, and the regs can't change it. So it leads to the question, which in fact at our, at our program last week, oh, and this is the point I was trying to make to you afterwards, which is um, it could be perfectly fine to d adopt a set of regulations that uh, could anticipate whether or not uh, the city chooses to go in a certain direction, like, for instance, adopt social consumption. And you can say, well, so they're there, they do apply. Alternatively, you can say, well, we could also wait until, you know, a, you know the city takes in a certain action and add to the uh, regulations at that point in time. That's just a, that's a call, and you can make arguments both ways about that. The point that I had made previously, and I'll try not to repeat myself from last time, as others have uh, you know, from, because a lot of folks has, have spoken in success in meetings, it's, it's much more about the process we adopt, okay? Um, not as much the content. And what I mean by that is that it is a relatively new situation uh, on behalf of the uh, uh, East Hampton Healthy Youth Coalition that, I'm, that I participate with. Um, we're trying to have, participate in a way that gives, uh, allows us to uh, look at uh, other jurisdictions, try to glean information, and be able to present it publicly as best as possible. And if we're going to take that type of process, which is let's try to look as these things roll out uh, in various places, and there was reference, for instance, to Washington State, there's been reference to Colorado, but all of them are relatively new. If we're going to just, the, the question is the pace and the scale of what we do here. And we would just, the coalition would, would kind of look to say, if we are going to try to take a, uh, uh, an approach that, is, that is, accounts for the experience um, that has happened in other jurisdictions, and more importantly, the experience that we have ourselves as we roll out a program, then that might be the best way to bring everyone together step by step. No one's got a crystal ball, okay? There are going to be folks who are, and there are, Folks, very enthused, um, you know, by the prospects. I think I, I think within the panel, that's that's that that's true. But we don't know yet. I mean, so so you, I don't think you have to hearken to the worst of fears or the or the highest of prospects. The reality is, it'll be somewhere in between, uh, probably. But the question is how we go about it. And I think what the what was the point that was made uh, earlier is, can we do it in a way that is um, that enables us to to be able to examine what we are doing as we go. I made the point, I'll leave you with the last analogy, which is it's the proverbial, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, paste in a toothpaste container. When you roll it out and push it out, that's fine. If you ever reach a point in time where you say, mm, well, maybe we, took, maybe we pushed too, too much out of the tube, it's pretty damn difficult sometimes to put it back. These folks are gonna go through a, you know, a, a, a process that's very bureaucratic, 
uh, it takes a lot of uh, work and a lot of effort. Uh, and at the end of it, you know, there will be a license, there will be some kind of grant. It will be a very difficult situation if we ever feel that we're going to have to roll back that. Those are folks that are going to have rights. Um, and I think it would be a really, you know, be a really messy situation, unfair to both the citizens of the, of the community and unfair to the licensees uh, if we don't do it in a way that kind of gives them a sense that what they're going to be doing and how they're going to be participating is going to, is, go is consistent with where the city wants to go, um, step by step. We'll have that first test on that, on the, on the social consumption issue. We'll see where people are at. Um, um, and again, you know, which tack you take, but whether kind of putting it in now in anticipation of that or later is, uh, is just your call. But in terms of the scale, I guess we'd be, we'd be looking for a process that enables us to look at what our experience is, starting with the, you know, with the medical marijuana dispensary and moving forward from there. So I just wanted to repeat that just for purposes of, of uh, the record there. Thank you. So Stephen, would you be, can you, um, I guess maybe explain, so I, I get what you're saying is that you want to see things maybe rolled out a little slower. Yeah. Is, that, is that a correct assumption? Yeah. Uh, and um, is that something that the coalition has talked about specifically around number of licenses, around like? There's no, no hard and fast positions. That's, why, that's the point I'm just saying, that the, the, the emphasis is on process not on the on the substance thing. So I don't, I don't but, think you, unless you get the process right, you can't even get to the others. So the but, point. But the process is, I mean, I think part of the process is how many that we, we ultimately allow. Ultimately, there'll have to be decisions made there because, you know, you're going to be doing this on so, a So, and I guess, basis. like, what, so what's your biggest concern about the process at this point? Well, the, the, we've had a good, we've had a okay. good and open so process. So you like the process? Oh, no. Okay, process I just want to make sure that. No, no, there's not the concern. But the, the, okay. the question is, ultimately, I think what, the draft that you are going to refer to the full <laughs> council is going to reflect in terms of further, I mean, we're looking at the process in the, in, the, in the real scale. What are we going to experience in year one? How are we going to build that into year two and year three? There are a lot of folks who would love to just kind of get it all out and say it's a great opportunity. Let's roll it out. Um, and I think what, you, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is we might end up perhaps at that place, but, but what we're trying to do uh, is trying to do it in a way that links the education and the information we have. I'll give you one last example because I think that we spent time last time talking about the history behind this. Mm -hmm. And there's a history that um, a lot of people read in terms of issues of social justice and civil rights, et cetera. Totally fine in another way. There's also another history which is that, you know, we, we are understanding more and more about on the, on the um, medical side, on, on the effect on brain development. And frankly, a lot of what we're learning is that at least until age 25, there's a lot of changes that occur. We're not relitigating anything. Sure. It's t age 21, but I'm just saying we're learning. And for the folks who are making analogies to tobacco and to alcohol, if you want to put it in context, okay, yes, it's true. We had a society in which tobacco um, had, uh, you know, w was not constrained, okay, let's put it uh, to a certain extent. Um, and so, yes, we had tobacco anywhere. And so people are saying, well, because we had tobacco anywhere, how can you, how can you make the case that, that the location of, of a, a dispensary that has tobacco from a school ever, ever showed that that gave, um, you know, that, that led to greater smoking? Although we did find, ultimately, uh, through litigation, that tobacco companies, of course, did what we thought they did, which was trying to sell to youth. Most industries care about the, you know, the, you know, who's going to be who's going to be future customers? It's a natural thing. So I think it's a little bit of a false analogy to some extent to look at tobacco because we're creating a new industry right now. Yeah. We never had the same opportunity with tobacco to create it. It was already, so to speak, in place. Right. Well, problems. and tobacco is quite a bit more dangerous. Well, and we've learned a lot, haven't we? Yeah. I'm just suggesting by history we're learning more about a whole range of things, including marijuana too. Right. Thank you. So Thank you. the other thing I'd say too, Steve, is that, I mean, I appreciate your caution and wanting to be wise and looking at all the information that we have set before us, right? But in any situation, you have the opportunity to be someone who follows or someone who leads. And I'd say East Hampton has a wonderful opportunity here to be a leader in the Commonwealth, 
to create one of the best ordinances uh, for recreational cannabis that could be an example to the rest of the state. Why should we follow along what everyone else is doing? I mean, we are to some degree. We're looking at, we're looking at legislation from places like Montague and Salem, but uh, East Hampton has an opportunity. Now we're dealing with, okay, fair enough. Now that's a characterization of what it means to be a leader or not a leader. I will tell you, having sat through a fair amount of testimony at this point in time, okay, from what you just said, there are, there are folks representing a number of communities who, who claim that same mantle. Uh, Holyoke is a perfect example, okay? The previous Cannabis Commission, the mayor came and testified. He sees it as an important part of the economic development of that city. And maybe he's even right about that. There was a state representative that also spoke today. Again, strongly in favor from Holyoke, whatever. And there are gonna be different communities that are gonna do it. I, so, you know, what's a leadership position? I don't know exactly. There are gonna be some people who argue that a, a more deliberate approach is in fact a leadership position. And, and, the, and the communities that may look to that later are gonna say, geez, boy, East Hampton, they took leadership, they did it right. So it's, it's just where you're coming from. I don't think it's as simple as whether you're a leader or not. Well, it also gets back to this idea of perception, which we talked about with the buffer, um, you know, because uh, I think it's a perception whether you're leading or not, and, and I think that um, that's that's fine. You can make that that statement. Uh, however, if you know if we create something that is responsible, it's respectful, with the input of the community, um, and with the input of you know people that are in the schools are, and we and we do that right for East Hampton. And I don't care if you characterize it as something less than leadership. That's that's what I was put in office to do. Um, and, and that's what 66 or 67, or, or no, I guess maybe 64% of East Hampton voted for. So, you know, I think that that's. And listen, again, the numbers are the numbers. And I don't disagree with you, right. you, know, with the, you know, with the election numbers. And, you know, and, and I think the people, you know, I think 64% of East Hampton we can, residents, we can agree, wanted to legalize a certain substance for adult use. Absolutely. Right? No adult question use. about it. I think those same folks who voted yes, okay didn't vote yes, um, thinking that they wanted, at the same time that they wanted to legalize for adult use, that they wanted to, um, in any form or fashion, have a negative effect on youth. I don't think there were folks who voted yes saying, ah, be it as it may for youth, okay? That's my sense, and that's what we're trying to do. Okay, good, uh, appreciate your, yeah. your thoughts. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Okay, uh, anybody else? I think we do, we have more, more lines. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Elizabeth Brown. Uh, I live in neighboring Holyoke, about 10 minutes from here. I work in Northampton. I'm in East Hampton quite a bit. Um, I'm Southern born and raised. I've been here for about four years in the North. Um, so I've seen a lot of different sides to this topic in North versus South. Um, so I appreciate the progressiveness of this area in this town. Um, so there's two points that I really wanted to bring up that I, I didn't really hear tonight, and this is my first hearing here that I've been to. One's a little bit more personal that really refers to the opioid crisis in this country. Um, my mother is a disabled person. She lives in Florida and she relies on opioids to be able to function and due to the opioid crisis, um, the way that it's been gone around in her state especially, there's restrictions on how much her doctor is allowed to give to her so now she's in even more pain and her quality of life has diminished. And I could definitely see her as somebody who could benefit from using cannabis for her pain. And I know quite a few other people in this area specifically who are in the same boat. And when you look at other states that have moved forward with completely legalizing cannabis across the board, you actually find a dramatic drop in opioid use. And you see a dramatic drop in other things such as crime and other violent acts. So me personally and people in my circle, we view cannabis being completely legalized as being something that is good for public health and safety because that information is there. We see that especially in Colorado. When I went to Colorado, I saw dispensaries a lot. There's a lot, they're everywhere, but they're regulated very, very strictly. And I see from y'all's draft that there are some very good things put in place to protect people. So I personally do not view it as something that is at risk for children because it's obviously being something for adults and it's being strictly regulated to where children are not having access to it. But, so that's my first thing is a, for opioid crisis. Um, second thing is economy and tax revenue. You look at these other states, 
they have accrued so much tax revenue from this that has actually benefited all citizens, their education, their health care, and infrastructure. And you also see the jobs that come out of it as well, which is very, very important, and it helps local economies as well. Um, East Hampton is a small town. There's not a lot of space, so I see any sort of extension of buffer zones to be nothing but an attempt to restrict how many businesses are here. And as you have said, there's no evidence saying that buffer zones actually do anything. It's just simply a, a perception. So at the end of the day, I think that a lot of people who are going to be pursuing to be business owners in this cannabis industry um, are, from what I have seen and heard, are people who are responsible and want to be part of the community and better everyone and do it in a safe way. So thank you. Thank you. I just want to, um, for anybody that's interested, a 2014 study published in the Journal uh, of the American Medical Association um, found that uh, states with medical cannabis had 20% uh, fewer opioid-related deaths. Uh, and then there was also a 2017 published, uh, study published in the American Journal of Public Health found that opioid-related deaths declined in excess of 6% following the legalization of adult-use cannabis. So I think that's important. To and, and that's this, this graph? That's this graph right here. Oh, is that the same graph? I believe so, yeah. Because there, there's also a graph too. I don't know if that's the same one. There's really a one. There's a great graph out there actually showing the intra, the, the the rise in opioid uh, deaths in Colorado, and then there's a specific line drawn, and which was the date of introduction of recreational cannabis in Colorado, and then you see a sharp decline in that same line. So that's just something to consider. Very similar to that graph. That's what I was asking. I'm really fast because I'm coming back up for my second time. I appreciate your patience. Um, I didn't mention before, um, one of the things when I would ask my mom a question, she didn't want to answer me, she would ignore it. And so I call that momming. And I find that when we're talking about this issue, I get that a lot because I'm saying, what are the concerns people are having? And I'm just not really hearing specific concerns. And if I don't have specific concerns, how can we possibly as a community address things that we're not actually articulating? We can't articulate what the concerns are. Okay, no cannabis for kids, we're there. So when we think about social consumption, my personal concerns, and I'm someone who did vote for it, my concerns are, is this gonna bring rowdiness to the community? My concerns are, is smoke gonna be pouring out of a venue? My other concern is, is this going to increase the likelihood of sexual assaults in our community? Now those are three things that, um, based on my knowledge of this um, substance, are not going to increase or cause distress or um, problems in our community. So maybe we could think about things like that as we go forward when we're thinking of what to address. What are the specific concerns? So as far as the tone of our town, I think it's going to be beautiful, peaceful, loving, serene, with less violence, less domestic abuse, less punching outside of bars. So thank you. Thanks. And relative to that, I just want to point out that the uh, police chief and the, the whole police department are very involved in this, and he is very uh, interested in what this ordinance looks like and he has weighed in a number of times with a lot of those kinds of concerns he understands that it's coming he just wants to be able to keep the citizens safe so it's on it's on his docket and it's at the top of his list Good, thank you and just about, about the smoke issue in places where this is legal um it you, the smoke doesn't come out so it's not like you're going to see it barreling out so and the noise also if you've ever been in a large um, convention which I have where people are smoking marijuana the noise level is so <laughs> people are polite when they bump into you they say excuse me there was a beer stand there six dollars a cup beer no one was in the line the place was quiet there were thousands of people there that was in Denver Colorado a few years ago packed thousands of people zero violence really peaceful environment so if you don't know what it's like there's plenty of ways to see it for yourself now you don't need to do it Hi, um, Lee Shore, 53 Holyoke Street, Unit 1. Um, so I really committed my life professionally and personally to helping um, bust stigma 
and one of the things that's been a recurrent theme here is where did this um, concern originate? Was it um, qualitative? Was it quantitative? Was it based on something rational or was it based on something personal? Um, where were the divisions coming from? Who was trying to convince whom of what? And I am the evidence that marijuana is safe, that it is a, a very um, important you know, substitute um, for a lot of the things that people use recreational and medicinally. Um, I had a brain hemorrhage in 2012 and as a result had incredible headaches and was put on narcotics and continued to get sicker and sicker um, and hurt more and more. And my physician who knew that I had smoked marijuana said, do you still smoke marijuana? I said, yeah. He said, well, have you considered trying a little bit? And I said, no, because I don't want to put anything in my brain that might be dangerous when I already have a healing lesion up here. And he said, well, um, I've researched it and it's safe. And so I was at a point where I was losing a couple of pounds a day um, because of this medical condition and because of the drugs I was on and that I was actually feeling worse from. And it was like the clouds parted and I was in tears thinking about um, how after just a couple of pops, I ate my first meal in weeks. Um, I stopped like cringing and it was just this remarkable feeling. And what broke my heart was thinking how many millions of people around the world um, don't have access to something that's safe um, and ought to be legal and ought to be accessible to people. Um, to think that what people are being given to help them with their health is actually killing them, um, it's brutal, it's cruel. And the people that are you know, putting the information out there that would make something like this scary are the people that have a vested interest in keeping those drugs legal, in keeping the alcohol legal, in keeping the tobacco legal, and making sure that when I go to pick up, you know, potato salad at Big E, if I need to, I can grab a six pack on the way by. I don't know how many people um, in the Healthy Coalition stopped to talk to their kids about alcohol when Budweiser commercials came on during the Super Bowl, a sport where kids get head injuries and concussions. Don't know if anyone captured the little statement, one of the players was nailed, went down, and the announcer said, oh, he's off the field. Uh, it's not a concussion, it's just a head injury. And they went on. I mean, we've got a sport that's causing, you know, incredible lifelong um, damage. I don't know what's being done to address that. There are things that are literally hurting and killing people that we're supporting culturally um, mm -hmm. all the time because they've been accepted, and this has not been accepted. I would much rather have an opportunity to go downtown um, and in a, you know, a place where it's socially, um, you know, I'm able to socially imbibe, um, have a place to go and do that, you know, to relax, to be around people that are smoking instead of a bunch of people who are getting rowdy, uh, drinking alcohol, it turns me off. Um, so I just think that you know, I am evidence that it doesn't turn you into this cruel, nasty, terrible person. Um, take my word for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want you to know um, that there are probably people in this room that you're surrounded by if you're concerned with it, that you probably aren't concerned with them. And we're the kind of people that would be going and, and going to these establishments. So I just want to kind of bring it back around and, and take a look at the, the way it helps people. Um, and the kind of people that might be going to these places. And um, I'm around, you know, if anybody ever wants to chat about what it's like, I'm, I'm around, so um, I think that's it. I'll probably think of a million things once I sit down. <laughs> that's, that's, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Lee. Thank you. So um, anybody else would like to speak? Seems like we might have one more taker. Russell Brain, Park Hill Road for 10 years. Um, just a comment on what I heard tonight about perception, and I'm sure that, um, that you guys are taking this into account. It, it seems like by causing a buffer zone or s somehow pushing pot smokers to the behind the mills, the other side of the track, 
not in the main business district, the perception would be made that for, for the children, I have a grandchild in center school, that if I were to experiment with marijuana, which I've been considering, <laughs> that somehow I would be a lesser grandfather, I would be a lesser East Hampton resident, I would be a taxpayer that didn't get to flaunt my rights of legal use of whatever, that I would have to go hide. The perception I need my grandson to have from the school is that the many people that he cares deeply about that may be cannabis users are no less of people and that they shouldn't be shunned and pushed away from children. I don't believe children should smoke, of course, but I also don't believe that they should be taught to judge people when there's no, no um, legal reason for it. Thank you. Thank you. You want to do one more? One more. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say real, real quick that um, as a sponsored cannabis athlete that I am working very diligently with scientists, doctors, wellness practitioners, and coaches to specific programs for taking into account, uh, taking into account dosages. So there's now studies out there that I can email you guys at a later time um, about what the different generations and use percentages that are out there. Millennials have gone down 3% in use. Generation Z has gone down uh, even more than that. But baby boomers have gone up 63%. <laughs> so there's going down, there's going up. And then... Because <laughs> we have and, a lot of pain. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. So these studies are now being pumped out. Whether they're new or not, they're studies and they're real and they're facts and they're being done and corroborated by coaches, wellness practitioners, doctors, everybody's out, everybody that's out there. They all got their eyes on this, and so it's all happening, and I, uh, I can uh, shoot an email to you guys sharing those yeah. studies. Yeah, please, yeah, awesome. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you so much. Um, so I think, you know, one more thing uh, that I wanted to say was, I, th I think that, uh, first of all, I appreciate everybody coming out and giving input, um, and I appreciate the school coming out and, and Williston, um, you know, I think one of the things that we would be negligent not to acknowledge is um, the potential uh, income revenue. And I'm only mentioning this last because I, it's the last priority for me as a city councilor. However, I do think it is relevant um, that a 3% local option tax that we would um, you know, forward uh, to the mayor uh, along with an ordinance would allow us to capture 3% of any recreational uh, cannabis sales um, direct, directly to the consumer. Uh, and another thing that hasn't been mentioned yet is every um, recreational cannabis business would have to enter into a community uh, host agreement. Um, and in that host agreement, you know, I don't think we would try to, to gouge um, you know, the fledgling businesses, but I think that there would be a reciprocal, um, you know, I think it, I believe at this point it's up to 3% um, of, of revenues would c come to the municipality, I mean, I think that that can be, that's a little bit more negotiable. Um, but it's also about, like, what's their impact on the community gonna be? How are they, like, what are the things they're gonna do to give back? I mean, I, I could only wish, you know, this, <laughs> that we could get other industries to do so similar things um, to this, because as we look at a new school, which is critically important for the city of East Hampton, um, you know, we have a unique situation here where we have quite a bit of land that is off the tax rolls. And, you know, so what we can do to make up some, for some of that shortfall, I think is critical. And I know that I've had discussions with counselors where we've looked, talked about how can we use this 3% or maybe a little bit more with a host agreement. And I think, you know, looking maybe to uh, help the, the school uh, impact on, you know, vulnerable members of our community would be really important and intelligent to look at, you know, elderly people that are on a fixed income and they can't afford the, the levy on that's going to be assessed from the new school, maybe establishing a fund that we could use to help offset that for the first, you know, whatever, 10 years. Um, and, and I think that that's important because we are in this unique situation where, you know, we're, we don't have tax revenue from almost half of our downtown area. Um, and and that, that puts us in a, in a bit of a, 
uh, a step behind other communities that don't have a large nonprofit educational institution in the center of their town. Um, you know, so I think that that's important to recognize, um, that this could be a way for us to not only address all of the things that we've talked about, but really to take off some of the burden of the people that are going to be most affected by the, the new school building. Um, and so I just wanted to say that. I have no power over that. That's going to be a discussion with the mayor, because all that money goes to the general fund. But that's what I would hope that my counselors and the whole council would advocate for uh, in that situation. Um, now, as far as procedure here, um, I think what I'd like to do is maybe just go over a couple like um, big ones, the kind of uh, pieces of this ordinance that came to me, and then maybe just discuss those briefly. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I maybe what I can do as the chair, I can take those things that we talk about and put them into a, a document, a new document that at our next meeting we can like really start hammering out the details, sure. yep. where it's more of a working meeting. Yep. Um, and so the first, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll start, unless you guys have anything. No, go. Go for it. Um, so the first thing I wanted to address was the discrepancy on, um, you know, recreational cannabis in not being allowed in industrial zones. Yeah. And so what I did, and I'm sorry I didn't make copies for you guys, but um, I, I created, a, a, I have a table that has all 11 categories that the state has defined. Um, and uh, basically looked what I thought um, would fit into these different zones. And so, for example, um, you know, uh, retail st sales would be allowed in downtown business, highway business, um, industrial, and mixed industrial, which is basically the only difference there is that it includes industrial. Um, and so testing laboratories would be able to be basically anywhere except for residential zones. Um, a transporter, um, a third party operation, someone who takes cannabis from a dispensary and brings it to a retail store could be in any of the zones. Um, a research facility could be in any of the zones that are non-residential. Um, I see that you have a couple of outliers and a couple of blanks. What are the yes. exceptions? So neighborhood business, um, so now one of the things that was brought up, um, Mike Tautznick had brought it up previously, was out, outdoor cultivation. Um, and that is that is a category, but um, I'm not exactly sure how that's going to fit into the, the final draft. Mm -hmm. But greenhouse cultivation, I think, is something that is interesting. And so that is the only; those are the only two things that fit into residential zones, and those are our agricultural areas. Um, so R80 is, and R40 are our, like big open fields, and residential, um, the, like agricultural zones because we don't have any defined agricultural zones. So you're saying uh, big open fields, okay, go ahead and grow it? There well, that's not allowed right within now. Within a building? Within a greenhouse. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, say you had a, a large field, um, you know, on your property and you wanted to not use so much power mm -hmm. and you wanted to put a greenhouse there in agricultural zones, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, but that, again, that would all be by special permit so if the, if you know the neighbors were going to be adversely impacted then that there would be a process for that would there be a specific uh, security regulation that would be all those? established by the state <clears throat> okay um so if and and we can we can talk about the greenhouse um stuff but i just thought it made sense to, since the state is defining that mm -hmm. um it would make sense for us to have that in there as well okay. um so really the only change in this is besides greenhouse is the um allowing um, the retail in industrial zones, mm -hmm. which makes perfect sense to me, at least. Yep. Um, okay, uh, and then I feel like there's there's more. Um, so, well, you, one thing that well, one thing that keeps being brought up, Mr. Chairman, is uh, the number. Yes. And is there a way that we could drill down into that a little bit more and, and make it something that I don't want to use the word palatable, but maybe explain what that number might mean or how we can can we discriminate between many of how many retail spaces could be allowed in like X type of zoning area or something like that. I, I agree. I mean, it seems like that's one of the biggest concerns um, is the number. Um, and I think that there's probably a way that we could look at. Um, I know that uh, Peg had talked about a graduated rollout. Um, I think it might be interesting to explore our options to say whether we could, you know, put a certain number in certain districts. So, you know, uh, 
two dispensaries are allowed in mill industrial and industrial. Uh, two um, uh, retail uh, establishments that are storefront only, not social consumption, are allowed in downtown business and um, highway business. You know, something like that, where we look at breaking them down a Aren't little bit. Are some of those also in the recommendation from the CCC? Oh, yeah. How many of what kind? And uh, I don't think they give a, sure a number that. recommendation, but um, but I, I think that maybe that's something that we could kind of fool around with. Because, I mean, we don't want downtown to be saturated. No. No. Um, but then again, we also don't want to uh, stop an empty space on Union Street right. from getting a tenant because it's you know more than it's too close to a school. Um, so I, I'm gonna I, it, on the the draft I do. I'm gonna leave the 200 foot buffer, and I'm also gonna talk specifically about path of travel. I'm not gonna say 200 feet as the crow flies. I think path of travel makes more sense. Um, you know, which means that you walk out the front door, you have to take a right and walk down the sidewalk, and then you get to your destination. I think path of travel makes the most sense. Um, but I think that, Councillor, that is a great um, thing to talk about. Um, so I'll, I will take a stab at that. Um, and if you, if you all don't have any uh, opposition, I, one, a couple of the things I wanted to strike from the zoning was the requirement of 75% uh, LED lighting. Uh, it seems, I know that I, I talked to, to Steve um, from INSA and at, that would basically put them out of business as far as we could, it seemed like. Um, so that means that sounds like a regulation that is, uh, I can't remember what the state uses, but uh, basically insurmountable. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. to them being able to be successful. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, it's, it's, it's well intended to create measures for energy conservation to be energy responsible, that an industry that basically depends on high-powered lights in order to produce its product, right. I think it's kind of... And that being said, I think we can leave the section that says, in, as part of the special permit, they would have to have an energy use plan and, and potentially offset their energy use with buying credits. But I don't think it's something that we necessarily should mandate what percentage of lights they use in their their business. Um, so if you don't mind, I would strike that piece out. Yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, there's one other uh, piece that I was looking at, and I believe... You, I'm sorry, you mentioned that what you would want to keep those, the energy use plan and... Um, and just the over, this overview. This is yes. section B, 4B, uh, one, okay. Yep. Um, and, I, and I think all the other ones are, are, are the, as what far as the standards and conditions. Didn't we talk about pesticides? The pesticides one, I mean, that's what I'm looking for. Is it should be under standards. Uh, that's the one that I'm trying to find here. They may have. I think they might have left they may that have out. They taken that out because I think that was discussed, at the, I remember that yeah. being discussed at the board meeting. And um, that, that I thought was removed. And so uh, um, if that's removed, then that's great. Um, and the other thing I was, uh, would like to do is to replace the definitions with the definitions that the state has. Yeah. Um, and, and I think once we get that, that'll be a place where we can really start moving forward. Okay. Uh, does that sound agreeable to everybody? Uh, Anything yeah. Anything you want to add? The only thing I'd want to add, and I'm just like thinking out loud here, is you know one 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 category that we we've glossed over a lot is the the, the, the proposed craft co-op, uh -huh. which well, is we really basically about. essentially creating these licenses for. And I forgot what the number is. I think it's up to six separate uh, cultivation uh, locations and then three processing facilities. Right. And I don't know if there's any way to kind of build in, because I think that really fosters local economy. It's much like what you're seeing in the local brewing industry where you actually get uh, discounted licenses if you promise to use you know, locally, locally grown uh, grains and I think hops too, I'm not sure. <laughs> but it's a way of encouraging uh, a very broad local economy um, and, and not to say that we, we don't want to encourage some of these lower, long, uh, lo I'm sorry, larger cultivation operations, but it also, it brings a lot more people into play. And if you want to talk about creating jobs, there, there's ways to, 
there's a happy medium there. Sure, I guess is what I'm I, saying. I, I don't. I'm just thinking out loud more than than really thinking of any specific policy. No, I, I agree with that. And I, I mean, I think a good example of that is is our craft beer kind of phenomenon that we've had in East Hampton. I think all three breweries are enjoying each other's success, um, and I would hope that you know that could be a symbiotic relationship as opposed to ab adversarial relationship, which I think it is with our breweries. They they seem to coexist nicely. So um, I think I think that is something that is in. Um, the latest state regs and we'll make it into ours. Um, and as far as timing of our next meeting, um, I, our, we are having a joint uh, meeting with the planning board to kind of go over the changes that we make on February 20th. So today is the 5th. And that's at 6 p.m.? That and that's at 6 p.m. So, that so we need to meet next week. And Wednesday is Valentine's Day. And I'm in so, and you're, Thursday and Friday. So Thursday. let's go. Let's do. Want to do next Monday? Can you do next Monday? Uh, or next? Uh, or uh, wait. So I can do I have, next Monday or next Tuesday. I have ordinance in here for Tuesday. I don't maybe know you're. Maybe you're already. Maybe I was pre-planning. <laughs> so can you do Tuesday, mm -hmm. Peg? All right. So let's do uh, Tuesday, six o'clock, and we'll be downstairs. So if anybody is interested in coming, that's going to be more of a working meeting. We're not going to be taking a lot of input from the public, but we are going to be discussing things. And the way I usually run my meetings is, um, you know, if we're if you have something pressing and you want to, I, you know, I'll, I'm not going to stop you from speaking, uh, but we just have to be nose to the grindstone. So that's six p.m. Six p.m. on the thirteenth. And, and and clarify this. Too for me, Ms. Uh, as a person who's been on the council for a while, the chair yes. of the committee, subcommittee, uh, people who want to give input but can't attend, is it acceptable to submit email and as long as that's submitted Absolutely. into? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so that Record. would be S Derby at easthampton.org. Ozarit at easthampton.org. Peg Conniff. P. Conniff. P. Conniff. Peg. East, oh, oh, it's Peg? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't get my whole first name. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, to, we're, 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 we're happy to take uh, testimony written, uh, emailed, uh, phone, uh, whatever. We want to make sure that everybody has their voice in on this. So uh, if you are interested, come out on the 13th and uh, have a great night. Can I have a uh, motion to adjourn? I'd like to make a motion to adjourn this meeting. Second. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. My email is That's what I thought. I know. <laughs> what? How did you do that? How about the recording? I didn't even think about that. I was, I was more. Uh, hey, oh, it's okay. So listen, guys. I apologize, but I gotta run because I actually didn't cancel my practice tonight. Oh. So can you can you uh, give me one second? Absolutely. Um, so so just for Wednesday.